Ooh. All right, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back. Guess what? We finished Loom. It was interesting, and the story did whatever it wanted. Oh, yeah. What a, what an unusual series of events that took place. And I'm wondering, Sean, how is it made? What? I, I don't know what you're asking me. How is, how's it made, bro? How is it made? How you doing? Like, how, hey, how, how, how's it made, LeMail? In, in your expertise, <laughs> like, I mean, the, the, some weird things happened getting to the end of that. Like, how, well, how, did, how did the game end up being what it is? Yeah, I think that's what I'm asking you. Okay. I, I mean, I, like, honestly, I feel like... There is, there was some kind of an expectation of a sequel. I, I feel like this game is at least really? partially reliant on the idea that the franchise will continue in some way. Um, that doesn't excuse. <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much fucking exposition in the last ten minutes of the game. I literally, I like, I really don't really understand how that happens i that's i mean i guess i understand how that happens like you want to start a game off fast you don't want to front load exposition right you want to you want to get the player playing early you want to create exposition right at the end well i mean i guess that's what i'm saying like don't do that but i but i sort of understand how that happens like you want to create a world like like really this is a lost problem right this is a narrative problem where your goal at the beginning of the project is to create a world that is um compelling and intriguing and mysterious you want to you want to you want to make something that's going to make the player engage and make them sort of ask what's going on what's next and that's great that's fine the problem comes at the end when you sort of have all of these narrative threads that you need to wrap up. What I don't understand, I mean, I understand in a project like Lost, right, that's, that spans multiple seasons that were not planned for and has, like, all of these different narrative threads that go off in different directions over the course of, of the production and then, you know, you get to the end and you realize we don't have a lot of time to sort of put all of this back together like that can fall apart at that point. I don't really understand a game that is produced all at once. Like where presumably the story was written and vetted in advance of production of the game. It feels a lot like it was just sort of like like it it feels like it was produced linearly. Like like they got to the end of the game and they were like, I don't know how to wrap this up. Let's just put it all in some exposition. Like Which they had is... the train. The train was rolling down the tracks before the the tracks were done. So I, I the want... John Henry was straining. Which, I mean, maybe that's how it happened. Like I know. So so I'm, I'm, I'm trying. To, yeah. I'm gonna read some of the reception. Um, all right. Yeah. Tell me how. Like so. What this was 1990. 1990, yeah. Orson Where Scott does this Tra fall in the LucasArts oeuvre? Was this like, was this, uh, this is before Monkey Island? I don't, I don't know. Is this before Indiana Jones? I, I, God, I hope so. I assume so. So Orson Scott Card praised Loom, writing that it was, quote, like He's a fucking you... writer. Uh, well, okay, if, we, if we scroll up, apparently he gave minor feedback to the game, but had okay, greater feedback right. in later LucasArts titles, so... He said it was, quote, like nothing you've ever seen or done before, a work of storytelling art, and cited the game's flexibility in adapting to play styles, whether using action or puzzles. Which I, I have no sense talking of. Talking about Loom? Yeah. Dragon okay. gave the game five out of five stars. Computer Gaming World gave it a special award for artistic achievement as part of the magazine's Game of the Year award, stating that Loom's colors... Uh, Loom's colors, mesmerizing special effects, soundtrack, and user interface combined to make it a work of art. Scorpio of Computer Gaming World approved of the game's graphics and, it does and have gameplay, colors. but said that it is, it, as an adventure game, is a little too lightweight. She stated that the game was impossible to fail with very easy puzzles, 
but that the linear gameplay resulted in no freedom of movement. While praising the story, Scorpio wished that Lucasfilm would have given it an epic treatment instead of loom simplicity. Okay. Sure. So I mean, it, was, it was actually originally... Holy shit, I can't believe what I'm about to read. Originally, Loom was to be the first game of a trilogy. Aside from the cliffhanger ending, the game contained several other hints pointing towards a sequel. Um, the two sequels planned were titled Forge and The Fold. Starring, and in The Forge, the protagonist... Wait, you're fucking kidding me. The protagonist is Rusty Nailbender, who's the... Jesus Christ! Okay, so Ryan Buckwalter tweeted to me exactly this thing and I thought it was a joke. Who's Ryan Buckwalter? That sounds I don't know. like a character He's friends with Rusty Nailbender and Fleece Firm Flanks. <laughs> yeah, that's... <clears throat> uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that this was proposed it, to me it. on Twitter and I... Did I you accept? Did you accept? <laughs> did you say I do? You do? <laughs> oh my gosh! As an attempt at humor. I literally did not believe that this could possibly be true. But you're telling me that this is true. No, you're telling no. me this is actual history. Rusty, Rusty, the guy who was sleeping, we were like, wake up. And he was like, fuck off, I'm sleeping in a graveyard. And, and then, then later we got him eaten by a dragon. <laughs> okay, yeah. He is okay. not only the star of the sequel, but he is also described as, quote, Bobbin's friend. Bobbin's friend. Friend, right? Oh, I mean, friend. like, is it, in the nineties? Did you take running punches at people and then be like, "I made a friend today"? I did. I mean, I don't know about other people, but that was how I acted. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I got. I, got, I have a couple things to say. First of all, I want to say, uh, Loom was indeed released in nineteen ninety, uh, which was the same year as The Secret of Monkey Island. Uh, and two years before Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, um, but a year after Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I also want to... Wait, this was a year after Indiana Jane, Jones and the Last Crusade? Yeah, yes. Yes, really? that's correct. Yep. And then I, I'm, oh, I find this super Crusade. curious. In 1992, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis was released also a game called Indiana Jones and the Fate of, Fate of Atlantis, the action game? Um, Wait, what? Yeah. There's an action game. Well, there's also, in 1989, there's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the action game, and also Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the graphic adventure. Really? Apparently. I don't know what to make of that. Um... So just to place this in the context of a timeline. Yeah. Okay. Same year as Secret of Monkey Island. Okay, so so there, there there's something to consider here, which is that, like, you know, if you say the graphics were amazing and the art and the sound are amazing, like, a few years before, Maniac Mansion came out, which was, like, super, like, very awkward colors. Yeah. Because they just didn't yeah. have any. And, I mean, that's absolutely... An improvement on top of the other two, but like I mean, the, in in a lot of ways, this is a beautiful game. Yeah, and I gotta say, like <clears throat> the idea. So I mean, I mean, okay, we were making fun of it, but the idea of removing an inventory system and replacing it with this sort of like, you know, series of spell. That's that's that it's is very clever. super innovative. It's very yeah. clever. It to me, it it um uh you know, precedes, it sort of foreshadows uh, games like Phantom Hourglass. Um, well, uh, if uh, you think about something one. like Banjo-Kazooie, you know, or Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, so many um, games just introduce to you one move, and then it lets you play with the move a little bit, introduce more moves, and oh, yeah, by the end of the game, you have dude. like 20 different moves that you can do. And I, I mean, mean, the, the, the big one for me is Ocarina of Time. Sure, yeah. yeah. Like, where you are collecting well, a giant pile oh, sure, of totally. skills. I'm just thinking, the thing, the thing that's amazing about Phantom Hourglass, which is, what, like 25 years later, is, is Phantom Hourglass is about this economy of knowledge, right? It's not about things, the inventory items that you acquire throughout the game. It's about information that you learn. And, uh... 
and that I feel like that's what Loom is all about. It's about sort of taking what was an artificial system of inventory items, right? An abstraction of the idea of collecting and holding material objects and and converts that to uh, a system of you know collecting and understanding and remembering information that's actually that's like super fascinating i yeah. love that i wish that somebody had made a better game around that idea you know i actually really did not mind i mean i joked about not knowing it but that was more of like a poke at myself than the game sure it's like shit i didn't take any effort to remember any of this and shit to but be fair the game the game literally comes with a manual in which the spells are described and there are like blank like spots blank where you're spots supposed to write for you to in. fill them out yeah and if you um don't do expert mode which is what we did it actually shows you like a b c d e f g like on the on the stick oh uh -huh. so okay you, you saw how there was the stick and you know we were talking about having to just click at the exact spot there's actually like a graphic beneath there oh but only on the easier mode Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, okay, so so that mechanic I'm a fan of. The thing that, that I feel like is indisputable is that the story was odd. Yeah. And I don't know if this Jesus. is because storytelling has changed. Because, I mean, you think about Mario, and Mario doesn't even have any explanations. It's just like, get the right. princess. And then you play it again, and it's like, ah! Keep getting the princess. Here. Come on, get the princess. And like that feels normal to me. Like if I go back and you know play a very old Mario game, I, I, I'm fine with it. It doesn't matter at all. Or even um, cause I'm trying to think of like very simply constructed story. Okay, like John Wick. John Wick was like, hey, this guy's dog was killed and he's pissed. That's the movie. <laughs> like, that's it. That's the, I mean, it's just, like, so simple. And that feels, like, fine to me. And then, like, they try to put in a whole bunch of, like, concepts. That there's this loom and there's ancient ducks that are in charge of weaving songs with distaffs. You know, <laughs> like, that sort of thing. And it just, I don't know, it was just weirdly, t I don't know, it felt weird to me. Ah! I mean, I just, I feel like, I don't, I don't feel like this is something that we have learned since 1990, but I, I think that there are, there are rules to good narrative, and that includes not saving all of your exposition for the last, you know, 5% of the story. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's, that's a well-known, like, like, guideline for producing I mean... something understandable. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, if only they'd had access to one of the people who, you know, wrote or was responsible for the narrative structure of some of the most widely accepted and praised, uh, you know, works God, wouldn't that in great? popular popular media <laughs> several you know, decades before. I mean, I think it's funny. I, I This is a whole other conversation, but it's it's funny that they give him a writing credit when apparently, you know, he, he he did some minor consulting work and they were like, fuck yes, let's put his name on it. I mean, <laughs> like, Jesus. <laughs> that's kind of weird. Yeah, that's like, that's oh, like if, yeah. your, if your friend comes up to you, he's like, hey man, uh, I'm working on this, uh, I've never done this before, uh, just trying it out, and you're like, well, oof, uh, wow, yeah, you've got, uh, you certainly got something there. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, and it's like, thanks. Then he just like puts your name on it. It's like a Sean Bouchard joint. It's like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. 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 You know, I. God, where is that? Like, I think one of my, one of one of the books that has influenced me the most of all books, is called Scene and Structure by Jack Bickham. Oh. Um, and I've talked about this before. Um, I think maybe with you, with you fine gentlemen, but I mean, it, it's basically a book that focuses heavily on how to structure 
scenes in storytelling and informations in storytelling, particularly for novel writing. Okay. And the sort of thesis of the book is that you need to learn the form and the craft of writing in order to express the art part, the creative part, well. Sure. Um, and it's not that they're at odds. It's not like follow the formula and ignore what you want to do. It's that this lets you do it in the same way that if you're an architect and you want to make a beautiful building, you still have to understand the structural rules of like where they will need to put support beams to make sure your whole building doesn't collapse. And working right. within that is what allows you to make beautiful buildings. Um, and one of the things that he writes in there is like right off the bat, it's like within the first page, or I don't remember how what the uh, length use. I'm just going to say page. Within the first page the reader needs to know what the story's about. There's obviously exceptions yeah. to this rule, but you've got, you've got to let them know right away what on earth the story is about. Um, or within the first three pages or five but it was like it was something that like, immediately I was like no, that that can't be. So I just like went through and pulled like six books off my bookshelf and every single one, like, right away you know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> like no, totally. every single one. And I don't mind if there is... Now I, like, look for that whenever I'm, like, watching TV or reading a book or even just opening up, like, someone. Like, oh, here's a post of, like, a story that happened to me when I was in high school or whatever on Reddit. And the ones that really grab me are the ones that just, like, right away, it's, here's what it's about. And I feel like Loom, I did not know what it was about till I was done. And then I realized that yeah. it, I wasn't quite sure if it made sense. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, I was... <laughs> The end. Sorry, I'm, I'm just sticking <laughs> with you now. I was um I was complaining earlier about like I feel like this game. Uh, okay, granted, I missed the first you know twenty minutes of it or whatever. But and if you played it, it felt like you actually missed it. <laughs> I I mean that's the sense that I get. I sense that I like didn't miss a lot, and I feel like the game does not set up. A, uh, it doesn't establish a strong central conflict. It doesn't like. It doesn't tell me. I think your like, central conflict is with chaos, right? Okay, so can we? I mean, <laughs> we've got three minutes, right? We've got three minutes. Can I? Can we? Can we come to? Can we talk about like, um, uh, hero's journey? Can we talk about like the story circle? Do it. Can yeah. we? I mean, can we just like look at the idea that? Um, at, an, at a high level, on, on an abstract level, we start in a place where the character, where the protagonist sort of is comfortable and then something happens that calls them to adventure, right? There's something that like changes. Well, the, the call and they to adventure, to... I think, is when the swans go away and Hetchel tells you you have to do something. Yeah, but I like do something, I feel like is not a call. Do anything. Right? And the fact, the fact that for us, for us as viewers, as audience, as players, like that moment communicated as Heschel says, do something, right? There's clearly something wrong with that. That doesn't, it doesn't communicate well enough what the goal is. Like, what are, what are we doing? What are we supposed to, what is the purpose of this? Yes, we are going to go, we're going to journey into the underworld. We're going to sort of undergo some change. I guess, like literally, li the, the only change that I see, I see two changes. One of them is we come, we become like a master of spellcraft. But the game doesn't really acknowledge that, which is weird. And then the other is we turn into a swan. But that doesn't happen until, like, literally the last minute. So it's weird to, like, I don't understand. And then, and then we don't return to the world. We, like, literally leave the world. Like, this is not, a, I, my point is, there is not a full story here. This is the first act of a story. And, and, like, I can understand wanting to create something that sets up for a sequel, that sort of implies a larger world or a franchise, but you, I don't think that you can, you can, like, put down three hours and call it a game and have it not tell a story. Yeah. You can, yeah. well, you can try I mean, well, I mean, you can clearly. Yeah, clearly I mean, you can, and if the graphics are good enough, it'll get good reviews. 
but uh, I, but you know, thirty years later, people will play it and say, "What the fuck just happened?" Yeah, no, it reminds and, me, and, of... and 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 what happened is exactly that. Yeah, and I mean, like, I remember hearing someone talk about an important thing to keep in mind with a mystery novel that, you know, oftentimes there is a big surprise reveal that the author plans for, like a really interesting twist that happens close to the end of the book. Okay. And that, you know, it's a 300-page book. First 200, 250 pages of setup might indeed result in a really rewarding, compelling, interesting, cool um, just twist and payoff for someone who waited that long. But you still have to make sure that that 200, 250 pages is entertaining because there's a whole lot of people who will read those who will not be willing to go through all the slog of the setup simply for the payoff. And that the real struggle is not to have the good twist payoff, it's to have it be compelling the entire time. And that it's more important to have something that's compelling the entire time with perhaps not as amazing of a twist, but just to make sure that someone is engaged throughout. And Well... You know, it, yeah, I'm it, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, I mean, it, just, it just reminds me of you know what we're seeing here, which to me personally felt like ten disconnected things, and then it stopped. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that I think my complaint is very related, and and it's that, and and you see this sometimes with with narratives that are sort of all that are very focused on the the idea of there being a twist at the end. Like a good twist is not about changing the direction. I mean, it's about changing. It's it's about recontextualizing the story that you've seen, right? A good yeah. twist makes you feel like all of the pieces fall into place all of a sudden, and the things that you thought you understood, you realize were wrong. Yeah, it's good without and- the twist. Yeah, right. No, absolutely. But and and the twist is not about introducing new information that you didn't have. It's not about sort of like creating a new story. It's about um I I mean a good twist makes you look back at what you already know and realize that it you, you already didn't know it. Know it. You, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Like you should know 90% of what you need of what makes up the twist the twist should just be like it's a twist right it's not a new fucking plot point it's just like uh <laughs> it's it's a recontextualization of of the information that's already been presented and if you have to introduce a bunch of new ideas in order to explain the twist i feel like you're not doing that right you're not doing the twist exactly you got a twist, and you got a shout. You got to do them both in sometimes sequence. You have to untwist. <laughs> and sometimes you have to untwist. I don't know, man. It's um. Bill, it's do you have any mystery. final thoughts? Do you have any final thoughts, Bill? Well, I mean, how many days? How many days worth of content is there now for mostly walking? <laughs> See, <laughs> we've probably it's... done fifty of these. Sure. Fifty shows. Yeah. Or I mean, no, we've done fifty. Yeah. How many we weeks in a year? Week. We haven't done every week. Fifty-two weeks in a year. Yeah, fifty. Yeah. Okay. So fifty shows. Yeah. Times you, of you two and gotta half pick hours. a nicely divisible number that people can process. If you say sixty. Everyone zones out and can't understand what you've just said, but 50 is... So it's like 125 hours of content? Divided by 24. Let's definitely call it content, too. That yeah, I think, I, think, I think we could do a mostly content. walking a thon solid for like five days now. That's good. Nice. We should. <laughs> um, this is, yeah, content. We're content creators. That's what we're doing right now. We're just shitting it out. Um, <laughs> just pushing, pushing hard. Yeah, as soon as as long as that little light's on, I know it's content. That's what I always say. I just wanted to take us to that point, uh, just to acknowledge that we're all part of this content. And uh, I think okay, it's been good no, content. Good. It's good. good. It's good. Way content. to sum up. I like it. Yeah. Any final slots, Sean? Yeah, I mean, 
<clears throat> we played a lot of games that were critically acclaimed at the time that they came out, and I feel like don't age well. And I feel like Loom is a really good example of a game that doesn't age well. Um, that you know, a lot of what made it special was the technical achievement uh, at the time that we take for granted. I mean, you know, and this was this was a totally playable game, and it was it was uh, easy to look at. Um, it was easy to interact with, uh, like it, it was up to sort of modern standards in terms of usability. Um, but nothing that, that stands out to us at this point. Uh, and I feel like a lot of what made it special at the time is that that was not so common. And so now we look at it with a more discerning eye. We look past sort of technical achievement, uh, and we look at sort of what's the content of the game. What is it trying to say? Uh, and this is a game that I don't know. I, I don't. I, I don't know what happened in the design process that made it so exactly bad. what it is. It's. I mean, it, the story God. is really, really rough. The story is just really rough, and. Um, and that's a shame. The the mechanic, the core mechanic is brilliant and I think not used particularly well. well uh, you know. and I, I you know and I and I think that that's the kind of thing that that in its context in 1990 you would look at that and say, "Well, shit, that's a brilliant mechanic." And that was enough. Like that was that made it rise head and shoulders above everything else in the field. Yeah. Uh, and and there's something magical about it. Don't get me wrong. Like I understand people who played this game when they were young and feel strongly about it. But I think that like you have to look now at what we've achieved as an art form, as an industry. And that creates a new context in which we view a work like this. And we can appreciate the sort of technical achievement for its time. Yeah. And we can appreciate the sort of brilliance of this mechanic. But if the mechanic is not situated w well within an interactive context, then it's hard to play. Like it just doesn't. And, and I think the modern sensibility demands more from a game then loom can create and i don't know if that's production problems or if that's just you know that was the style at the I, time there wasn't the yeah. bar wasn't high i almost want to call it the price of innovation so my my, my final thought yeah. is that uh poking fun at things is just really fun like yes. even, e even amazing amazing things like like i love poking fun at harry potter right like yeah like and i love those books right but God, oh my god, it's so fun. Oh my god. <laughs> Ten points from Gryffindor. Like, all that bullshit. Like, it's so fun. Um, and I mean, I, I, I enjoy poking fun at Loom, but of course, doing anything innovative is actually impossible. <laughs> like, especially in the gaming yeah. space where you are not making the thing, right? If, if you, it like... Um, if you, okay, take Jessica Jones that has almost exclusively female characters in significant roles. Um, you can just say as a creator, you know, I, I'm going to write a story that has almost exclusively females in a lot of the significant roles. And then it just happens, right? You get to just do that. But in a game, you don't get to say, let me just make the player do, the player's not going to, the player's going to do whatever the hell he wants. Like, this is a three-hour game. It took us six hours <laughs> to beat this game. It took us so long. Oh, my God. To beat this game. Because we just wandered around. We were loaded and looked at the same thing. You have no control in the way that you have control if you're doing a more linear media. And that's that's what always I find so amazing is when someone says, okay, what's the paradigm always been? Let me not do that again. Let me do something completely out of the blue. I mean, imagine how scary that is when adventure games are all a rage and you go... I'm going to make an adventure game with no inventory. And yeah. That is our area of expertise. Let's do that. So Jeez. even though I might look at it and say, well, compared to the grand space of things, pff, I didn't get the story. Even though I might do that, I still feel like, um, you know, media can do two things. It can, on one hand, be within itself entertainment. But on the other hand, it can also be a really valuable stepping stone for all the media that comes after it um the way that you see special effects 
be really bad in old movies that won the, the special effects award. Right. They laid the groundwork for the next people ahead of them to improve. Um, so, yeah. I mean, given the fact that this is all about old adventure games, which I think is a fascinating space because it is so difficult to design for, I feel, um, I, I, I admire how unique and different it was as a game. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Huh? I'm fucking done. You want to listen to my great music? You guys want to listen to my great music? Yeah. Well, I'm Day Nine. I'm Bill Grainer. <laughs> and I'm I'm Sean Bouchard. You're Day Nine. You didn't do your you didn't do your aliases. Oh. Oh shit. Oh, okay, oh shit. Yeah, because yeah, because he, my mother didn't you, be like I know name I him Day you. Nine and square brackets please. And she's like, before you cut the umbilical cord, it's all one thing. One. No, year, I understand umbilicus that. Maximus. I'm Day Nine. And I'm fun with Bill. And I'm NDEF. Oh, that was mostly walking. Done. Nerp, nerp. Herp, nerp. Nerp, nerp, nerp. <laughs>